come in here. Well, oh, not this is a good term for the guitar. She just didn't know how to make her. She was? Y'all make her mad. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'll accept that. Well, we welcome you uh, to worship this Sunday on this Sunday before Thanksgiving. Within the church, this is the end. This Sunday marks the end of the Christian year. And Advent, which begins next week, is the beginning of the year. And for the church, this has been celebrated as the reign of Christ or Christ the King Sunday. So the scriptures for the day will give us that sort of feel of how all of that happens. Several announcements to make I've been delighted to see so many of you already back there at the tables. I printed out Thanksgiving cards. The instructions are easy. Just do two folds and you got a card. And names of members who aren't able to get here are listed there for you that you can write a personal greeting to them. Place it in the basket near their name and I'll put them all in an envelope and they'll go to them tomorrow morning. So. Take care with that and send your greetings. Remind you that the daily Advent devotional booklets, there are some back here on the table with the offering plate. There are some still remaining out in the entryway. So take those so you have them when Advent begins to begin your daily devotions. Remind you of our Home for the Holiday Concert that we'll be attending on the evening of December 11th down at the Masonic Temple. Tickets are free. Just sign up with how many tickets you want. And I think my count, if I remember it right, is we have like 39 tickets uh, because of an error by yours truly. But if we can use them all, so much the better. So you can invite family, friends, just sign up, put the number, I'll make sure we have enough, and then starting next week, I'll have the tickets printed out, and you can be like Taylor Swift fans and fight over the tickets and see who gets what seat where, okay? Remind you of the community Thanksgiving dinner. That is always a grand event for those who, one, cannot get out, meals are delivered to home, or those who would not be fixing a meal for themselves can come to the Senior Center and partake of a great Thanksgiving meal. And finally, my thank yous. Send a newsletter out one day and it's done two days later. Uh, there's a new flower calendar for 2023, if you can imagine that, up on the bulletin board. Someone took the challenge and it was up there last Sunday when I came in. So it's up there for you to fill out your uh, desires of which Sunday you would like to give flowers for. The cost is still the same at $15. Are there any other announcements we need to make for the good of the gathered fellowship this day? Then let us with the sound of the prelude, let us worship God.
May all who are able stand for the call to worship. Give thanks to the Lord. Tell the whole world what the Lord has done. Sing to the Lord. For the Lord has done wonderful things for us. Raise your hearts and voices. Shout and sing your praise. For great is the Holy One who lives among us. in our morning prayer. Bounteous God, you have lavished your finest gifts on each one of us. We thank you for the many ways in which you have blessed our lives with love, hope, friends, our church, and so many other things that we cherish. Help us be a blessing for others that they may come to know you and rejoice in your love. Give us hearts of courage and confidence to step out into the world in service, bringing hope where there is doubt, peace where there is strife, love where there is discord. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first scripture reading for this Sunday comes from the New Testament book of Colossians, the first chapter, verses 11 through 20. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power, so that you may all have endurance and patience joyfully, joyfully giving thanks to the Father, 
who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued you from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Thanks be to God for these words this day. As we come on this Sunday before Thanksgiving, are there words of joy, words of concern we wish to lift up and share? Marlena? Well, we'll put, pray for safe travels for you and for everyone who will be hitting the road and traveling to be with family and friends for this holiday. Sue? Those girls are amazing. Are there others? Steve? We're celebrating our number one grandson who's achieving one of his uh, life goals and he starts at Winter Park Ski Resort tomorrow morning. Wow, wow. I heard that earlier and that's so great because I know, know Quinn had his heart on that. And that's great for him to accomplish. Has he been away to school that long now? Well, Jeez. he's not done, but he, he's uh, going to work on go to school by remote. Oh, okay. The period that he's out there, and he's going to come back at the end of March. He's going to go back to school. Okay. Not until September, he said he's going to do it until September. Well, that's wonderful. He gets that experience and that opportunity and where you and the Stewarts work. want to go and visit him. <laughs> <laughs> and let's remember Cookie too. She's been caught with a bit of a bug, and hopefully she gets over that quickly. I call us to be at prayer for those who were the victims in countless ways of the shooting last night at the Colorado Springs gay bar. Five were killed. Last I heard, 18 were injured. The assailant was subdued by patrons and held until the police arrived and were able then to keep the fatalities and injuries from getting any higher. But let us pray for those caught in this senseless act of violence and pray that we as a people can come together in ways that will heal the wounds within people to, that will uh, enable them not to wound others in any way or fashion. Let us keep all of these prayers, joys, and concerns within our hearts as we join appropriately together this day in a litany of thanksgiving.
Let us give thanks to God, our Creator, for all the gifts so freely bestowed upon us, for the beauty and wonder of creation in earth and sky and sea. We say thank you, Lord. For all that is gracious in the lives of men and women, revealing the image of Christ, we thank you, Lord, for our daily food and drink, our homes and families, and our friends. We thank you, Lord, for minds to think, hearts to love, and hands to serve. We thank you, Lord, for health and strength to work and leisure to rest and play. We thank you, Lord, for the brave and courageous who are patient in suffering and faithful in adversity. We thank you, Lord, for all balance, valiant seekers after truth, liberty, and justice. We thank you, Lord, for the communion of saints in all times and places. We thank you, Lord. Above all, we give thanks for the great mercies and promises given to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. To him be praised and glory with you, O Lord, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us each be at prayer. O oh, gracious and wonderful God, how amazing, how beautiful is your creation of the gift of life you have given us within our own being and within this world that transforms away and gives to us and provides for our living in each and every season. We thank you, Lord. And we come together this day to celebrate the wonders of this life. Many of us anxious for Thursday and the gathering with family and friends. We thank you for a community that seeks to care for those who cannot celebrate just on their own means. For that we give you our praise. We ask for safe travels for all the, those who find themselves on the road during this holiday time. May their, your safety prevail upon them that they may gather with family and friends and enjoy the blessings of love and the bonds of family. Be with those within our midst this day who are struggling with illness. And as we have lifted up before you, Addison and Olivia and their parents, May your mercies be great upon them and their lives. And we give our prayers of thanksgiving for Quinn. We have seen him grow from a little one to an adult now before our eyes and feel we are a part of this journey of his as much as it's his journey into adulthood. But we give you praise and thanksgiving that he can now do the work he has long envisioned and continue his studies at the same time. And gracious God, our hearts are torn once again by the senselessness of violence. Help us, O oh Lord, to be better, to communicate better with one another, to help people who are imprisoned by anger, find better ways to relieve their anger than acts of violence upon innocent people. We pray for those affected by the shooting in Colorado Springs, 
and we pray for our nation, for all of us are affected by this act of random violence. Help us be better, because you know we can do better. Transform us in this season, O oh Lord, to be truly thankful for the life and what you have given us. Whether we count it as a bounty, let us not prepare compare our gifts to the gifts of one another, but let us be joyful and thankful that the gifts you have given have enabled us to live and to love and to serve. For all this we lift up to you in the name of your Son, Jesus, who taught his followers, old and young, to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. moments and consider the, all the ways and fashions God's love and blessing has touched our lives so that our gifts that we give may represent all that we have received. Thanks be to God. Amen.
gifts to ours. We return these gifts to your service, O Lord. Bless them with your love that created the heavens and the earth, so that they may create a new heaven and a new earth here where we live. Amen. The Gospel reading from the, for this day comes from the Gospel of Luke, the 23rd chapter, verses 23 through 33. But they kept urgently demanding with loud shouts that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate gave his verdict that they, their demand should be granted. He released the man they asked for, the one who had been put in prison for insurrection and murder, and he handed Jesus over as they wished. As they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country, and they laid the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A great number of people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and your children. For the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breast that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. These are the words of God this day. Thanks be to God. I want you this morning to imagine this climactic scene that Luke paints. I want you to imagine that picture, that final picture, there on top of that hill of death. Jesus is in the center on the cross, his body beaten, his clothes gone, taken, and auctioned off. On either side of him, the two thieves hang. And then in the foreground of your picture, there are soldiers offering sour wine and mocking looks. The religious leaders who are there are scoffing at him, pointing figures and laughing. If he is the Messiah, let him save himself. If you look carefully in your picture, you can see the inscription over the top of the cross. This is the king of the Jews. And then, if you squint and look hard into the background, you can see the people, this throng of onlookers, this vague congregation. Luke doesn't waste his paint on them. Their faces are indistinct. Their expressions are indecipherable. All he tells us is this. The people stood by, watching. The people stood by, watching. But just because they're in the background doesn't mean they're not important. In fact, these people have been the driving agent in all that has happened in this last week 
through today. Only days earlier, Luke describes them as the gathering storm. First in praise, and then in thunder and lightning. Gathering the powers to be, the chiefs and the high priests, convinced that the only way to handle this matter is to kill Jesus. They do it to settle the people because they're afraid of a crowd. Ironically, it's these people who bring Jesus before Pilate. And as you might remember, they are the ones shouting, crucify him and release to us the murderer Barabbas. So the tragedy of Luke's gospel isn't that people are powerless to stop this story. The tragedy is that they have the power, but they use it for violent ends. Or as in this case here on the top of Golgotha, they just stay in the background. They stand their ground. Maybe they're dumbfounded. Maybe they feel helpless, powerless. Nevertheless, as you can plainly see in your picture, they just stand there watching. Now hold that portrait in your mind's eye for a moment, and let me paint you a different portrait for a few moments. His name was Zachary Presley, Zach, I called him. He attended the congregation I pastored, and he latched on to me for some way, in a big way, probably because he was a young boy who didn't have a father and mom was doing her best. He was always up there when I did children's time with his jet black hair. He came close to resembling his last namesake, Presley. He was a cute kid. He played in the village's local youth soccer league like, like every other kid in the village did. But truth be told, at the age seven, eight here, Zach wasn't a very good soccer player. Most of the time he would play in the left midfield, which I think is soccer's equivalent for baseball's right field, where, you, where the coach puts the players that they really didn't know what else to do with. Now, Zach's strategy for playing left mid midfield was kind of like this. He sort of knew he wasn't as skilled as the other boys, but he didn't want to, anybody else to really see that in action. So his objective every time not, was not so much to help his team by his play, but rather to minimize the possibility of exposing that he just wasn't very good at soccer right now. And so Zach played as safely as possible. He had this square of land, and that would be all he would protect or try to. If the defenders passed the ball up into mid left field, Zach would try his best to keep it going and pass it up to his team's forward. If the other team got the ball going the wrong way and it came into Zach's territory, he would do his best to run up and kick it and it didn't matter which direction, just get it out of my space. He was the guard of his own immediate patch of grass. You can just picture, can't you, Zach standing there while the game flowed on around him. He wasn't a great soccer player. 
but Zach Presley could stand his ground. At the end of the season, the coach decided that the players would get personalized trophies, each one of them engraved with their name and with the particular award that the coach was bestowing upon them. Of course, somebody got best passer, somebody got best ball skills, somebody got best leader. And when they got to Zach that night at the banquet, he was handed a trophy that said, Best Position Player. With this award, Zach really thought he had uncovered something about the tact tactics of soccer that no one else had ever figured out before. And here, this trophy was his recognition, his validation. It wasn't until about three years later that Zach came up to me saying he realized he had re what he had received was a backhanded compliment. That he won a trophy just for standing around and watching. So two portraits, not so different from one another and neither one of them so different from us gathered here today. After all, we stand here today in a tradition that loves to stand for things. From Luke's crowd standing in the background all the way through to that famous picture of Martin Luther himself testifying before the papal delegates and exclaiming, here I stand. I can do nothing else. Standing for things is the DNA of the church. Even the church has taken tough stands. The church has been willing to take stands for economic justice, social justice, the work of peacekeeping and for the right of people to love who they love and many other issues. This standing for things is what we do. It's what we do. And frankly, the church has been so good at it, so good at standing for something that somebody sometime ought to give us to a trophy. And so maybe you can see the problem. The field of life is so big and the game moves so fast and all of our standing can amount to so much watching. And so now in 20, 2022, the field is overrun with the brokenness of the world. And still more often than not, we in the church stand and watch. In 2022, the gap between the have and the have nots is wider than any time within our living memory. And still the church stands and watches. In 2022, scientists have projected that we will blow irreversibly past every conservative threshold for avoiding catastrophic climate, climate change. And still the church stands and watches. In 2022, we face story of abuse and wickedness throughout our national dialogue, unlike anything I've ever witnessed in my lifetime, and like anything permissible within the boundaries of a moral and just society. And still more often than not, the church stands and watches. We watch, and we watch hoping that the ball might come to us, but really, I think we're terrified that the ball might come to us. Yes, we are called to stand where the Lord stands and to stand with the poor, to stand with the oppressed, to stand with the forgotten. But there's a danger in taking this too literally because sometimes in order to take those stands, 
You just got to move. After all, Jesus is on the move. Check your portrait again. Because he's not there on the cross anymore. He doesn't stay on that cross. Luke paints a snapshot in time, but it's just a snapshot. It's not the whole story. Jesus died, yet, yeah, but Christ is risen. The story isn't over until the stone rolls away, and that is precisely what the resurrection means. It means Jesus has too much work left to do, and he can't do it standing still. That's the magic of the portrait we see today. Like the paintings in some stereo slide in an old viewfinder that you would just click one after another, remember those? Keep your picture moving. Linger in front of it for just a moment. Let your eyes take it in sight, but don't get too attached because it's on the move. Jesus is on the move. Advance to the next picture. And even that standing and watching crowd on the top of Golgotha lingers just long enough. And even they start moving. A few chapters later, that same crowd gathers around a Pentecostal flame and gets overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit and flows into Jerusalem as newly courageous apostles going into the world. Eventually, even that crowd gets moving. Eventually, all of God's children get moving. In the northwest suburbs of Washington, D.C., there's an Orthodox Jewish temple called Ove Shalom. As an Orthodox congregation, they observe fairly strict Sabbath laws, including abstaining, get this, fasten your seatbelts, on high holy days, they even abstain from the internet. Cell phones in pockets off nothing, okay? And so it was a few summers ago as the congregation emerged from late Sunday evening services. As they pulled out their cell phones and began to reconnect with the world, they finally learned what you and I had known all day that Sunday about the horrific mass shooting the night before at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando. You may remember the news of that onslaught. 49 people dead, 53 people wounded. Now, I remember waking up on that Sunday morning, June 12th, and reading about the Pulse. I remember carrying that news into this sanctuary. I remember the gas from a few folks who had not yet heard of this event. I remember lifting up those victims to God in prayer. And then I'm sure I did what I often do on any other Sunday. Most likely, I went out with some of you and ate lunch, went home, turned on the TV, and took a nap. But at Ove Shalom, they were not so content. When the service ended that Sunday night, as the congregation to the, began to disperse into the streets, and as they heard the story of what had happened the evening before, they gathered together and they gathered around their rabbi and they made a decision. 
Shabbat that they just finished celebrating. It's a celebration. It's a pilgrimage festival where you move during it. They had moved symbolic during their service, and now they decided to move literally. A field trip of solidarity was their decision. And they marched and walked to a gay bar a half a mile away. In telling this story, the rabbi writes that he hadn't even been to a bar in 30 years, let alone a gay bar. Nevertheless, they went off. About two dozen of the members of the temple, all dressed in their worship apparel with their yarmulkes, with their phalluxes, and all their robing, they went. They found their way to the fireplace a predominantly African-American gay bar in DuPont Circle. Now you can imagine that portrait as they walk down the sidewalk. It would be the great, greatest setup for a joke if it weren't so bathed in tragedy. Two dozen Jews walk into a bar. Indeed, the guard standing outside the club looked at them as they came toward him and was more than a little bewildered. But when they explained why they were here, this hulk of a man, bodyguard, broke down in tears. His cousin lived in Orlando and had been at the Pulse nightclub and was one of the victims. And they went inside and the mood was somber. They began to sort out things with one another, this strange mixture of people. They met another young man there who'd had a nephew bar mitzvah at their synagogue just a few weeks ago. Another came up to them and another came up to them and asked for a card so that they could come and visit them. After a while, the bartender shut off the music and the rabbi began to offer prayers for anyone, for all of them. They lit candles. They sang songs from the deep part of their souls, the tears flowed, the barriers collapsed, and the temple bought drinks for the rest of that night for everyone. And it's just one little corner of the world, of course, but still, but still, it's amazing what the people of God can do when they're willing to move. Here's the gospel, my friends. We can linger, but we ought not get stuck. Because the world today needs a church that moves. The world needs a church more than it ever has, but specifically, the world needs a church that moves. The world needs a church who will see this portrait a church that will recognize itself in this portrait, standing there and watching, but a church that will refuse to do the same. The world needs a church that's on the move, just as it has always been called to be from that first Pentecost morning. This, after all, is the paradox. For a church to be rooted in its deepest traditions, for a church to cling to its old, old stories, for a church to stand firm in its elements of truth, who and what is, it is called to be, for a church to stand so firm that it must become a church on the move. Because it has always been 
because those Pentecostal flames are on the move, because Jesus is always on the move, we know we cannot follow him just standing still, but by being on the move. So this is the good news, and the question it asks, will we be on the move? You and I, will we be on the move? Whatever congregation we might find ourselves aligned to this day, will you and I be on the move? The Church of Christ is called to be on the move. Even when we feel helpless, even when we feel dumbfounded as what to do and paralyzed, we remember that we don't move alone. Remember, we move on the wings of this Holy Spirit that lifts us up and moves us into a new day every day. Remember that we move alongside the grace of God that has traveled from everlasting to everlasting. Jesus got up and was on the move. Let us follow him. Amen.
from here and dance. Dance out into the world the song of Christ is alive and cares for all. Dance, move. Amen. Thank you. 